a couple of things that were sort of left, o left over from the previous lecture <coughs> um, that will be important for the, for the later on. So let me just spell them out. So remember how we used to write this uh, separation logic propositions such as amp and x points to v and then p star q and so on, okay? So these things always implicitly talk about the heap that, that you have around at the time when you are, when you are asserting the, the statements. So that's, this is called uh, a point-free style of specification. But for the later on, I will switch to a point-full style of specification wh where I explicitly name the heap that I have in mind. So I will, uh, I will have a name sigma for the current heap. And when I want to say that the current heap is empty, I will write something like this. Sigma is equal to empty, where this empty is the, the nowhere defined map. So each pointer has an undefined value in this one. Similarly for this, I will have sigma is equal to x double arrow points to v. And for this, I will be saying something like there exists sigma 1, sigma 2, such that sigma is equal to sigma 1 disjoint union sigma 2. And um, P holds of sigma, sigma 1, okay, and Q holds of sigma 2, okay? <coughs> so explicitly passing to each predicate the heap that I wanted to talk about, okay? And then, for example, uh, the, pre the post condition for a lookup, so remember lookup uh, had something like this, so if I'm looking up a pointer, v, uh, x, I'm sorry, then the precondition was x points to v and the postcondition was x points to v and r is equal v. Well now in this new notation I can write something like sigma is equal x, this double points to v and r is equal to v. <coughs> Where now this conjunction is an ordinary conjunction from logic, so it's not one from separation logic because it doesn't talk about heaps per se. <coughs> so it's, it's, it looks kind of pedantic now, but it will become important in the future because we will have situations where we don't only have heaps in our state, but other things as well. And then it, it, it becomes much easier to actually explicitly name which things you want to talk about. In ordinary separation logic, sequential one, and in the concurrent separation logic, you just have heaps around, so you don't care. If there's only one thing that you are labeling, that you are talking about, then it's fine to use a point free notation as well. But the point full will, come, uh, will become useful um, when we have more components to the state. One more thing now is <coughs> we need a, a one more generalization. So instead of talking about heaps, it just turns out that separation logic can talk about an arbitrary notion of state, not just heaps, but anything, as long as that something satisfies the properties of an algebraic structure, which is called partial commutative monoids. Okay. <coughs> So I'll, I'll define what that is. We'll, we'll call it, abbrevi we'll abbreviate it as PCM. Okay. <coughs> so it's a triple, so a PCMU, okay. It will be a triple where we have the carrier set, or carrier type, whatever you want to call it. Then we have an operation, join, and a unit for that operation, so one, okay. <coughs> so that, okay, uh, for every X and Y, <coughs> Okay, what do I want to say here? This operation, which is partial, by the way, so it doesn't have to return value on, on all inputs. Uh, it's commutative and associative. And this thing is a unit. So now, okay, because we actually don't want to, it's not so pleasant to talk about partial operations, I'll complete this operation. So I'll make it, so it's in most considerations of separation logic, it would be something uh, u times u and then partially u, right? So sometimes it doesn't give you a value. Instead, what we will do, we'll make it complete. So we'll, okay, <coughs> we'll make it always return a value u in u, but then some values in u we'll consider as valid elements and some of them will be undefined elements, so to speak, right? And we when we want the operation to be partial, we just say it returns some undefined value. 
So we, so we are, are joined. Where is the eraser? Does anybody know? Ah. <coughs> so we join one more predicate to this structure, which we call valid. Which says if, a, okay, we pass it, so valid has this type. We pass it an argument from u, and then it gives us a Boolean. If it says true, this element is one of those good ones, valid ones. If it says false, it's an undefined element. <coughs> and then you need a couple of properties of that, which is, okay, if A joint B is valid, then both must have been valid. So in, if it, during some computation, you get an invalid element, then whatever you are conjoined to it using this bullet, you are not going to, if it was invalid, you're, going, you're not going to make it valid again. <coughs> the unit is the valid element. Oh, well, and that's it. Okay. So now heaps are a partial commutative monoid, and you can see how. Okay. Or rather, let me say heap. Uh, heaps with one extra element undef. Okay. They are a partial commutative monoid because under disjoint union for this operation. Okay. <laughs> And if we take for the, for the unit, we take the empty, empty heap, the empty map, right? So you can see this joint union is certainly commutative, it's certainly associative. When we attach an empty heap to an existing heap, we don't change anything and so on. But if you try to join two heaps which overlap, you will get one of those undefined elements, right? So if, if the two heaps have the same pointer, you get undefined. Another PCM is natural numbers, okay? under plus, for example, and unit, uh, and, and zero, for, it, for the unit where the valid thing is, everything is valid, so all the elements are valid, okay? Another one can be natural numbers under multiplication with one and lambda x top again. Or you can take max instead of this and you're also gonna get a partial commutative monoid. <coughs> okay, so the important point is to, to, to emphasize again is that Instead of heaps, you can work with these guys as well. And all the inference rules of separation logic still hold. The frame rule, and so on. But instead of star, you use the join operation of the PCM. <coughs> OK, so that, with that out of the way, let's switch to concurrency. So I'll try to cover first some classical material, uh, which will set us up for later. <laughs> but let's use a, um, as a motivating example the following program. So this is also a classical program. Uh, yes? Sorry, I have a question. Uh -huh, go ahead. Yes? I'm sorry, conjunction. Valid A and valid B. Both have to be valid, yes. Boolean times. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so let's look at this program. It's very simple. It increments a shared variable x twice in parallel, okay? So we write it like this. First we grab a lock which protects our shared variable x. Then we read what's in x. Then we write t plus 1 into x. And then we unlock. And we want to run that in parallel with the same thing. <coughs> okay. Um, so lock L protects the shared variable X. And let me just, uh, we want to show, of course, that at the end, uh, what this program does is increments, adds 2 to X, right? Okay. It's obvious that that's what it does, but <coughs> we have to prove it. Uh, so let me actually use, let me just get out of uh, with some terminology because I'm bound to use it unconsciously or subconsciously in the, in the presentation. So let me just say, okay, <coughs> property that one, only one thread because of the locking can access the shared variable X at the same time is called mutual exclusion. Okay, people probably know that. When a thread holds a lock L, we will say that it's in critical section. Okay, and no other threads because of mutual exclusion can't be in the same critical section. Another alternative is to say that this execution of the block 
between locking and unlocking, people often, often say that that's executed atomically. Not because it's actually executed in one, one physical step, it may be executed in many physical steps, but because we have the lock and nobody can see what we're doing to X, for them, for the others, it looks like it's done in one step. Okay, so when I say atomically, or lock is in a critical section, or a block is holds the lock, that's the same thing. I'm sorry, a thread holds lock, that's the same thing. Okay, so now how do we, how do we go about verifying this program? Well, I mean, one very simple thing here is to enumerate all the possible interleavings of who grabbed the lock. In this situation, the left thread, by the way, uh, the stuff inside the parallel composition, I will call them threads. Okay. So all very often, also people think that thread is something sequential. Okay, but for us, it's not the case. We'll be able to nest this parallel composition. So anything that's an operand to parallel composition, we call it thread. <coughs> Even if it itself is not sequential, but may con contain our other parallel compositions. Anyway, so one approach to verifying this would be to, well, just enumerate the interleavings. E either the left thread goes first, and then the right, or the right thread goes first, and then the left. Because you only have one critical section on each side here, that's very simple, right? But you can see that that idea would not scale, because if you had a larger program here and here with more critical sections, then all the possible interleavings, well, you start using factorials to describe your permutations and so on, that doesn't scale. Okay. What we want instead is a method by which we can verify one thread first, separately from the second one, then verify the second thread separately from the first one, and then just to have, a, have some way to combine the two proofs into, into the proof of power position. Okay? So, uh, not surprisingly, that kind of a method would be called a compositional verification method because you decompose the problem. You verify this guy separately, and then put them together. <coughs> so this has been a very old problem with many ideas. Uh, and I'll start with one from 40 years ago. Uh, actually, let me start with one which is more recent, and then I'll go to the 40-year-old one. <coughs> and the more, and the, the more recent one is due to Peter Hearn okay, in CSL. CSL stands for concurrent separation logic. <coughs> So the so O'Hearn's idea was that, okay, well, we want to codify this, this thing where, whereby we verify the threads separately and then put the proof together. Uh, but his point was, well, if I know that these threads don't touch common shared state, common state, if they just operate on, on this joint of state, then I don't actually have to care about interleavings because whichever interleaving I choose for the two threads, whatever scheduler decides to, however the thread schedule decides to interleave them, I'm going to get the same result. And he, he knew that in separation logic you can express this jointness of state easily, so he comes up with the following inference rule which we will also use. Okay. He writes it like this. If I know that thread C1 has precondition P1, postcondition Q1, and the same for C2, then for the conclusion I can get something like this. Okay? I can split the verification of C1 and C parallel C2 into two and then just put the thing together but for the following whole triple, for the whole triple that you see in the conclusion. <coughs> yes? What do you mean there's no precondition? I'm sorry, you're completely right, yes. <laughs> yes, 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 okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, you still have a question, okay. okay. Well, this is how you read the rule. If you want to prove something about C1, C2, if you know that the state that you have for that particular program can be split into two, <coughs> then you, you, you get that in the end you can also split the, the state. Okay? <coughs> but if P1 and P2 are not describing this joint state, then this star will be a false predicate. So you will be proving something, uh, so you will be giving a whole triple for our program, but whole triple is a precondition pre false, which means all bets are off. You're not saying anything, right? <laughs> Okay, so now in our monadic formulation, it will be slightly different. Uh, we'll write it like this. Now we have some 
return value of type A1. Okay. So the precondition are the same, but now we return a pair out of the parallel composition. So now we need the post to change the post condition a little bit. Recall in Q1 and Q2, we use the letter R to name the return result. Now the return result is a pair, uh, but the first projection of that pair, we want to send SR to Q1. And the second projection of that pair, pi 2 of R, we send to Q2. Does that make sense? OK. <clears throat> so this is what we have in the case our threads are not touching, are working on a disjoint state. But that doesn't help us with this program, because in this program we explicitly have shared state, shared variable x. <clears throat> So for that, we need the second idea. And now this one is due to uh, Susan Awicki and David Grease. So that's from 1971 or two, something like that. Okay, And this is the idea. Let me erase this. <coughs> well, I'll erase it later. <coughs> if you want to separate, separately verify the two threads, we need some barrier, okay, some abstraction. Something which says, when I'm verifying the first guy, this is what I know about the second one, and I'll verify my first guy under that assumption. Okay, and, this, and then you have the dual thing for the second guy. So what they came up with is an idea of resource invariant. Okay, so that's a predicate over the shared state. So in our case, it will be a predicate over x, uh, which is supposed to hold off your shared state when no thread holds the lock, OK? Then each thread follows the following protocol. You grab the lock. That means because nobody held the lock when you grabbed it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have grabbed it. You would have looped forever waiting for the lock to be released. Then you can assume that I holds of, the, of that shared state, OK? And while you hold the lock, you can change your shared state. You can mutate it any which way you want, not necessarily preserving the invariant because other threads cannot see that you're messing up with the state. But when you unlock, before you unlock, you better restore the invariant so that when the state goes back out of your, so to speak, uh, possession, the invariant I still holds of everything. So you see how it works. Each thread can now be verified separately because when I lock, I don't care what the other guy is doing. I know that I got something hold for which I holds. Okay, uh, And he can also verify his stuff separately from me because he knows that, OK, if he grabs a lock, I holds. But then we have to have follow this protocol whereby whenever we release the lock, we restore the invariant uh, back. <coughs> is that, is that, does that make sense? I'll make it clear with the inference rules if, if that's not clear, but eventually, not, not right away. Because before I do that, we need a third idea. And this one is also due to O'Hearn. Okay? And the idea is as follows. Well, we can Greece ver uh, implement this idea on, on state where there was no, not on heaps, but just on ordinary state variables, stack variables, so no pointers. Um, and O'Hearn now formalizes it with respect to pointers. And the idea is as follows. When I lock, okay, not only do I know that the invariant i holds of the shared state, but in fact, the state described by the invariant i gets to be my private state. Okay, it comes to my possession. This is how you would write the rule for locking. He doesn't use lock and unlock. He has one composed thing where he first lock, then do something, then unlock, but I'll split them separately because just it emphasizes the point. So if I start with an empty heap, by the time I finish, I will get the invariant i. And unlock is the opposite. Before I call unlock, I better provide some, some heap 
for which I hold, because otherwise I wouldn't be even able to call unlock because the precondition is not satisfied. And then when I terminate, the heap is gone. By the way, if it's not clear why I'm talking about these predicates or about ownership here, look, if I start with nothing, then I own I. And the interpretation with ownership comes from the parallel composition rule. When I split two threads, and then when, when I let the first one run on P1, the second on uh, P2, because P1 and P2 must describe this joint state, I can, whatever this guy messes with, this guy cannot mess with. So I can say P1 is, uh, uh, pointers described by P1 are owned by this guy, and pointers described by P2 are owned by that guy. So you see there is this ownership idea here, that whatever appears in my precondition, that's what I own. Those are the pointers that I own. <laughs> so by that account, once I lock, I start owning the invariant. And once I unlock, I disown that, that heap. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so let's see how that works on, on, uh, on one example. Okay, just to, it's, it's not very difficult, but just so that people uh, get familiar with this idea of ownership transfer. <clears throat> so let's try to verify a simpler program than, well, no, okay, yeah. Let's take the invariant i, which says something like, exists n natural number such that, and I'll start using my point full notation, sigma is equal to x points to n, and n is even. Okay, so when nobody holds the lock, x stores only even numbers. And we want to show that this program I'll need one more command, but I don't have space, so let me squeeze it somehow here. I want to show that this program, I can give it, okay, which precondition do I want to give it? I want to give it a precondition which says I start with empty heap. And yes? No? Okay, no questions. And I want to have a post condition, hmm. which I'll write here, which says I have empty heap again. And I return a, an odd value now. Is it clear what I'm trying to prove and why that should be? Okay. <clears throat> so this is the proof outline. We start with the empty heap. Once we lock by this rule, yes? The second rule is anything, right? You just return an odd number. Yeah. We'll, we'll How do I know that you did anything with your other function? You don't. If you want a better spec, that, that will be the next step, but it requires yet another idea in order to be able to write the better spec. But I just want to familiarize people with how the ownership works, that's all. So this is a really dumb spec. <laughs> it's intentionally so, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I could put a random number here, multiply by two and add, add, add it to t, and that's, I will be able to prove the same thing. How does it work? Well, okay, after the empty, we get something which says, Okay, let me use again the point, <laughs> the point full notation, um, which says exists n such that sigma is equal x point, points to n and even n. Okay, so suddenly just the heap sigma comes from somewhere else, from the ownership of the resource into my private stuff. The resource now has empty bec sigma because now he has no heap, but I have the, I have the heap in, in as my private state. So now I can just reason using ordinary sequential rules that we've had in the previous, uh, in the previous lecture. So out of here I get, okay, exist n such that, uh, let me just copy everything. Um, well, first of all, we want the rule of existential quantification. So we, we remove the existential, but put the n here. Okay, then we get sigma points to t, because we have now just named the contents of x, we have named it t, and even t. 
So n becomes t. <coughs> now we just mutate x, so now sigma becomes x points to t plus 2 uh, and even t. <coughs> now here we need to reestablish the invariant before we unlock. And the invariant is like this. So, okay, we just need by the rule of consequence to introduce a quantifier back. So we have exist n, but now this n is what used to be n plus 2, right? Such that um, sigma is equal x points to t plus 2 and, I'm sorry, points to n now. And even, well, if, if t was even, then t plus 2 is even as well. So even n again. Um, and we can also, by weakening, just get the following property. Sigma is empty and even t. So we are framing now the rule for unlocking. Okay, it says have an i, return me an emp. By framing, I can just remove this guy, which is the resource invariant, and re replace it by empty. Okay. Well, let me do that somewhere else. <laughs> So now after unlock L, I will get amp star and then, okay, this stuff, sigma is equal empty and even T, which means since amp is the unit, I can just erase that, so we get that. And then I do a return T plus one and I get sigma is equal empty. And of course, r is odd, <coughs> because r, r is t plus 1. <coughs> so this is clear, right? Upon locking something, the invariant just shows up in your state. In your heap, upon unlocking, a chunk describing the invariant remo is removed. That's all. But as was observed, this specification is really dumb. Okay. You really cannot say anything more interesting using this plain resource invariance. I mean, we have managed to abstract things, so we can, we can, uh, we, we can verify things compositionally using the rule of parallel composition. But we really need to say something more specific about what the, each thread does. And here's a, well, which idea that comes to be third or fourth? fourth. Again, due to a wiki reason, it's called auxiliary state. Okay. In order to, stay, to say something more precise, you need to introduce additional pieces of state which keep track of how much each of the two threads has added to x. Okay? So now our program, we have to decorate that, our programs with that auxiliary state and the code which mutates it. So now the program will look like this. Lock L, and then we have um, t bang x, <coughs> and x equals t plus 1. And now we have a equals a plus 1. And then unlock in parallel with everything is almost the same, except now we have a different variable here, b, and then unlock l. Okay. And we modify the resource invariant. Well, the resource invariant can now use these variables a and b. And in particular, the one that we would want for this particular program would be something which says our state consists of a pointer x storing a plus b. So when nobody owns the lock, the contents of x is the sum of a and b. So you can imagine if we verify here that we start from a0 and get a1 in the end, and here we start with b0 and b1 in the end, Okay, by the time we finish from this resource invariant, we will know that x stores a plus b, therefore it stores 2. Questions? Yeah, so we are using stack variables again, okay? We, I'm, this is the classical formulation of a weak increase, if that's where you were going. Okay, so those are not A and b are stack variables, they are, they are, not, functional, they are not functional variables, I can write into them, they're mutable variables. Yes, I'm sorry. 
I got carried away. The point is I will eventually remove the stack variables completely so this program will look differently. Um, but this is the standard, the classical formulation, so I want to give it to you first. <coughs> so let's see how the proof uh, for parallel composition now looks like. So that was for the single increment. <coughs> So this is a proof outline. I'm just saying here what, how things should look like, how I want them to look like, but this is not yet anything formal because I haven't given you inference rules. But I want to show you how, what we want to, out of the proof and then we'll backpatch. Then we will make the inference rules look like, uh, so, so that we can actually write that proof outline. There was a question there? No, okay. So we want to start with A0 and B0. <coughs> and we don't have any heap. So sigma is empty. Okay. And then we do our splitting here. So here we will get A is zero, and we don't know what B is, so B would be something. Okay. And sigma is empty. On the other side, we will know that B is zero, because that's the variable for the second thread. We will not know what A is, because the other guy can mutate it while we are working. And sigma is empty again. Okay, now we lock. <coughs> well, okay. We'll go get that A is zero. And now I have to name the contents of B. Uh, let me say it like this. And sigma is x points to A plus B. <coughs> because that's my invariant. Or in order not to use bank B, let me just say N, <laughs> okay? Does that make sense now? Because now N is ordinary variable. It's not one of those stack variables. I don't have to bank it. It's just logical variable, okay? On the other side, we get the dual thing, but with an exist M such that A is M and sigma is X points to M. I read x. Okay, well, I get, oh, first of all, rule of existential, existential quantification, we, we can remove the existential, and we can remove the existential here as well, as long as we don't forget to put them back in by the time we exit. So here we read bang x. Okay, well, a is 0, b, b is n, and sigma is x points to t. Right? We proceed to write t plus 1. We get a is 0, b is n, and is x points to t plus 1. Now we say a is, OK, I'm switching back to the a plus 1. <coughs> oh. OK. And now we get a is 1, b is n. Sigma is, okay, I'm sorry, it should have been all t. Uh, no, 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 no. N, and t is equal n. <coughs> n and t. Here n and t x points to, and now I can say x plus b, well, 1 plus n. Okay. And now when I do the unlock, the resource invariant is reestablished because now what's stored in X is the sum of A and B. So now I can just get back everywhere I should have had. Oh, no. Now I just get back sigma is empty. And that's it. Oh, well, and A is 1. And it's completely dual on this side, except instead of A, you use B everywhere. <coughs> so now, this is the original idea of a Viking Greece. This is how they would verify this program. 
So let's criticize this proof a little bit now, okay? I mean, the first thing is that I had to use mutable variables and I really didn't want those, okay? Uh, but that's not a serious criticism. In fact, it is, but if the mutable variables could be made to work well, I would use them, but they can't really. And the more important problem here is that, well, imagine I wanted to verify three threads. Okay, so this is inker two. But what if I decide to write a program inker three is inker two in parallel with inker one? Well, if I want to verify that program, then I, then I need three variables, A, B, and C. So yet another one. And I need to change the resource invariant to now says x points to A plus B plus C. Okay, that's a new thing that I have to add. But I have just verified the two-way increment using a slightly different resource invariant, but I have to do it from scratch. I cannot reuse that proof in a proof of a larger parallel composition because by adding an additional thread, the invariant changes. The proof of inker two has to change. Okay, you can see that the proof is context dependent. It depends on the context in which you take this program, which you have just proved, and, well, where do you put it, right? The proof has to change in order to work. <coughs> and it's even worse if you, okay, so that's for three, but what if you don't, you don't even know how many threads you're going to have? Let's say you're iterating over some list forking a thread for each element. Okay, so the number of your threads and their structure, how, ma how much you, in which order you fork them, it's not even statically known, right? It depends on how big your list is that you're iterating over. So this is, even though it's compositional in the technical sense that you can divide the, com the verification into two, so divide and conquer, it's not really in practice because, um, well, you have, to be, you have to change your resource invariant every time you want another thread. Okay, so that's not good. So that's what we want to, that's what we want to change. That's what we are after. <coughs> um, several other points. In each thread, I needed to know both of these variables, A and B, okay? So it's like I need A for the left and B for the right. I need both A and B for both threads, okay? Except in the first thread I modify A, but I know that B, B remains fixed. So this is very important, actually. Notice that I, throughout the execution here, I have kept, throughout the verification, I have kept the knowledge that B is N. So that when I come down here to unlock, I know that I have reestablished the resource invariant. Okay. <coughs> so I need both things on both sides. <coughs> and there has been a couple of solutions actually proposed in the literature. And in the lecture notes, yes? Yes. After you unlock, yes. on the left side, you don't know anymore what B is. Okay. I mean, immediately after you unlock, but before any other thread has a chance to work on B, you know that it's going to be N, whatever you started with. But once you unlock, you're not in the mutual exclusion mode anymore, and other threads can now mutate X and add to their... Yeah. The other thread can, can now go on and change the B, and therefore you don't know actually what B is now anymore. Well, um, I will show you the inference rules and then it will become clear, yeah. But I mean, I, I will change things, so it, this proof outline will have to be modified. I just wanted to show you what, what's wrong with the existing one. Yeah. <clears throat> so there, in particular, will not have an inference rule which tells you, oh yeah, B is now N plus one, or B is N. So, any other questions? So there have been attempts to use this A and B to model them. So I said stack variables are not really a good idea. So some people have decided, okay, let's make A and B pointers in the heap, okay? But you see, it doesn't quite work all that well. If you change, if you make A and B be pointers in the heap, then who owns them, okay? When I allocate, um, it cannot be that, I mean, both threads have to have access to both to both variables, so it's, the access is not exclusive. So you can, that rule would not quite work, right, for parallel compositions, parallel compositions. <coughs> because this part of the proof would want both A and B, 
pointers this time. And this part of the proof would want both A and B pointers again. But that rule doesn't give you that. So we'll do something different, which I think is much more in the spirit of separation logic. And this is the idea. So let me get the whiteboard down. <coughs> we'll modify the notion of auxiliary state. So it won't be any more stack variables, but it will, there will be something else which we'll call subjective auxiliary state. And I'll show you what that is. Okay. <coughs> One problem with this proof was that we had to have both A and B be global variables. Okay. Well, why don't we make them local? <coughs> local to each thread. Okay. Um, <coughs> But instead of calling them A and B now, let me give them a more abstract names. So I'll call them AS and AO. And AS stands for self, self-contribution. How much the thread in question that uses this thing in its scope has added to X. So that's a self-subjective variable, self-auxiliary variable. And this guy is other. Okay. <coughs> now they are local to each thread. What does that mean? Well, that means that in each thread you have both of them, but they can have different values in different threads. So in that sense, they're very similar to that variable sigma that I have introduced, that point for expressing heaps. Sigma was also local to each thread. Uh, well, in both threads here, it was actually empty, but you could, you could see that in different threads it could have different values. So what we will do is we will make AS and AO be on the same level as sigma, a variable in our specification now, this time, not a mutable variable, but a functional variable, okay, that we can just talk about. <coughs> um, in a two-way increment, for the left thread, AS would be, or the pair AS, AO, would be what we used to call A and B. So that's for the left thread. But for the right thread, this pair would be B and A, okay? In a three-way increment, if we did increment three, then AS and AO for the left thread would be A and B plus C. For the middle thread, we will have B and C plus A. And for the right thread, we'll have C and B, A plus B. <coughs> so the picture is almost like, well, it is exactly like this. Here we have the shared state, which says, uh, AS plus AO, and we have the auxiliary state here. This is AS, this is AO. So now each resource will come with some structure. It's, it won't be just naked heap, but there will be these two variables. Any questions so far? Okay, but in order to make this work, we need an additional to capture an additional invariant, uh, this is why. Okay, <clears throat> previously, if we had n threads, we would have n variables, right? A, B, C, D, whatever, n, up to n. But now, for each thread, we have two variables, although they are local, they're not global anymore. So you see we have two more information. n variables in the classical setting, two n in the local setting. So all these two n variables cannot be independent. We need to capture this point that when one thread changes its AS, so add stuff to X. That should automatically correspond to every other thread incrementing their own AO, right? So these variables grow in tandem, so to speak. When I change, I'm the thread, when I change my AS, AS that means I'm also changing everybody else's other variable. <coughs> okay, so and we need to axiomatize that interdependence between the, uh, these local variables of, of the various threads. <laughs> so how, how we should do that? How should we do that? Well, the main question is, since now every thread has its own AS and AO, what happens with the parallel composition? If I have children threads with certain values for AS and AO, what does that mean for the parent thread? 
Does this make sense? I see a lot of puzzle faces in the audience. <laughs> make sense? Yeah, okay. <coughs> so let's imagine that the thread C1 has, um, I don't know, let's call it A1S and A1O, and C2 has A2S and A2O. What does that mean for my parallel composition? Can somebody guess? So A1S says how much C1 has added to X, and this one says how much everybody else has added to X. Well, that here is C2 plus a third thread that may be running in parallel with us. So everybody else, right? <laughs> A2S says how much C2 has added to X. Well, then the parallel composition of these two must, have been add must be adding a, a sum, right? So A1S plus A2S. And what can we say about this guy here? Why? So it turns out it's not zero. But what we want to say, there exists some other AO such that A1O is A2S plus AO. This is a contribution of everybody who's running in parallel with the parallel composition. Okay? So, and we also know that for the same IO, uh, AO, we have um, A2O is A1S plus, A plus AO. There is a value AO which makes this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy coherent in this sense. And what is that AO? Well, it's whatever somebody else has added to X. Somebody who's running in parallel with us. You can picture it diagrammatically as this. <coughs> we have some parallel composition here, and this picture holds for the parallel composition. When we fork, what we are doing, we're splitting this AS now. So let's call them B1 and B2. Now let's call this guy C. So in the left thread, C1, we will have AS will be B1, but AO will be B2 plus C. And for the sec for the for T C2, it's it's dual. Right? So we have this wheel, but we're splitting this part and then we're combining things, right? <coughs> Does that make sense? <coughs> okay. So now we need a typing rule or inference rule for parallel composition to capture this. Okay. <coughs> By the way, you can also see that what this rule, what, what this idea is capturing is the fact that when I fork a thread, when I do a parallel composition of two things, then the left child becomes, so to speak, an invariant, I'm sorry, an environment thread for, for the other child, for, for C2, and dually, vice, and vice versa, right? So the left guy is environment for the right guy, right guy environment for the left guy. That's all that's going on here with this picture, right? <coughs> So now let's imagine, let's ignore for a while heaps. We are just talking about integer values now, about auxiliary state. And let's say that we have thread C1. Oh, I've embedded my functional notation. Has precondition P1, postcondition Q1, where now P1 and Q1 are predicates over AS and AO. And here I have P2, Q2. Okay, what do we get for parallel composition? Take a wild guess. Oh, everybody's cautious, I like that, okay. <coughs> uh, you get something similar to what we had before, but I'll put a circle because it's not the same definition of the star anymore. This is subjective star. I'm ignoring the return results because they don't much matter here. <coughs> but I need to define this thing. Okay. Uh, in a world in which I have these two things, and I want to prove P circle star Q, what should I do? By definition, so these are integers. Exi I'm just copying that picture. Exist B1, B2, such that AS is B1 plus B2. 
Okay. <coughs> and B1, B2 plus AO gives me P, and B2, B1 plus AO gives me Q. <coughs> So you can see this is very similar to separation logic, to, to that rule for, for power composition and concurrency, except it doesn't talk about heaps. It talks about integers. And it has this extra component AO, which the other thing didn't have. So this is a generalization of separation logic, right? <coughs> to handle auxiliary state. And auxiliary state only. So now we need to, for our incrementation example, we need both auxiliary state and the heap. So what are we going to do? We need to marry these two rules somehow. Any ideas? OK. So this is about integers. That, uh, I erased it. Original rule was about heaps. Both integers and heaps are partial commutative monoids. Product of partial commutative monoids is, again, a partial commutative monoid. OK? So if I want both integer auxiliary state and heaps, all I need to do is take a product of them, OK, and work with that. And everywhere here, instead of plus, I will just put an abstract operation bullet, join. OK? So if I don't care about heaps, I just take as my PCM, partial commutative monoid, to be natural numbers. If I, don't take a, if I don't care about those natural numbers, if I don't care about auxiliary state, I take this, uh, the PCM to be heaps, and I recover the old separation logic. And if I want both, I take a product. <coughs> In fact, it will turn out, if you want to deal with locking, we need yet another component in that partial commutative monoid. So, <coughs> we will not be just talking about heaps and integers, but we need to uh, carry an information which says who, who acquired the lock, who owns the lock. So here's a mutex, here's a partial commutative mon monoid of mutexes, that's how I decided to call them. Okay. Oh no, let's call it mutex. Okay, the carrier is, the set mutex contains Two, two real things, a, a value we call, enumer it's an enumerated type, a value which we call own and not own. And then we also need those undefined, which we, well, okay, one undefined value in order to deal with partiality. Okay, the joint operation is like this. I can write it as a little table. Uh, I get not own, if both A and B are not own, okay. If one of them is own, then the whole thing is own. Or, okay, or A is not own, B is own. And then the thing is undefined if both are own. Okay, what does this capture? Well, this is pretty easy to see what that is, right? Okay, the left thread has a lock, but the right doesn't, then the parent has a lock, okay? But what if both children have a lock? Then what do you say about parent? Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> that's the situation which we don't want to model. That cannot happen. So we just say undefined. That's how we uh, capture mutual exclusion, okay? <clears throat> So now, we can be even more general. And instead of, okay, so in our PCM, we will always choose heaps. We will always choose mutexes, as long as we work with lock-based examples. Eventually, we'll remove even that. So we won't care about locks anymore. We'll do non-locking algorithms. But for now, we, we do that. And then we can also have a user-supplied auxiliary state. It doesn't have to be integers. It can be any, any PCM, okay? Actually, in the lecture notes, you have an example of that. <coughs> OK. <coughs> so let's now write out the inference rules. 
or rather, actually, no, I have it here differently. Let's give a spec for the incrementation example. What, what type, what spec do we want to give to increment? <coughs> So this is how it will look like. Increment one, so just incrementing by one, and then we'll see what, what happens with increment two. Well, we'll say, ah, one, one more thing before I go, actually, okay. So now each thread has AS and AO, as I said, right? But the types of this AS and AO will be, okay, they all have a type which would be heap, in order for me to talk about heaps, then mutex, in order for me to talk about who owns the lock, and then user supplied PCM. Okay? I will, it becomes tedious to, to talk about triples all the time. So I'll just project values when I want to talk about individual components. So this will be sigma s for our first projection out of AS, mu s for the first projection out of, second projection out of AS, and here alpha s. And dually for AO, I will have sigma O, mu O, and alpha O. OK. <clears throat> so in, semant in the semantics, you just have two variables. But in reality, you're going to have projections out of them. So for the incrementation, what we want to say is, well, we start with sigma as being the empty heap. OK. We choose u to be natural numbers. So that's our auxiliary state. So that, we start with that being 0. And we start with not owning the lock. And when we terminate, we have empty. We have incremented by 1. And mu s is again, we don't own the lock. Does this make sense? So right, alpha s now captures how much we have added to x. But notice now it is doing it in a local manner, because this is a local variable for each thread. Okay, It's not A and it's not B as it used to be in the classical setting. So this spec now, we can, put it in, we can use it in different contexts. Okay, In particular, <coughs> this spec doesn't care how, much threads, how, how many threads are composed in parallel with inker1. We can do a proof of inker 2 now, so that's inker 1 in parallel with inker 1. But notice I'm not changing, I'm not saying this guy works over A, this guy works over B. I'm just writing inker 1 for a whole shebang which is involving the code, the auxiliary state, the auxiliary code, uh, and the proof of inker 1. And I will be able to prove for inker 2 that if I start with empty heap, and alpha s is equal to 0, and mu s is not own. OK. Then I split this. So here I get empty for the left thread. Alpha s is 0, mu s is not own. Dual is the same thing here. Then I just use this type. So I know that now sigma s is empty on the left side. Alpha s is 1. Mu s is not own. And the same thing for the right guy. Then, OK, here I had st circle star. Here I will also have a circle star. And if you unfold the definition of circle star, that just says, well, take the sums of all of these things. <coughs> it would be a little bit more involved if I actually had AO anywhere in this specs, but I don't here. I will have AOs in the proof of thinker 1, so it will still matter. But here what I will just get is the sigma s for the parent is the sum of the sigmas here, so that's just empty. AS of the parent is the sum of the ASs of the children, so that's 2. And the parent doesn't own the lock. Does this make sense? OK. <coughs> so you can see now, by the way, why I wanted this explicit naming. Because I now have three components to talk about, not just the heap. So I want to be able to name them 
explicitly. <coughs> and an interesting thing now is that the usual rules of separation logic hold for this spec, but not just over heaps, over other components as well. In particular, you see, I wrote here that increment is incrementing from 0 to 1, but just by framing on this component, I, I can get it from k to k plus 1. But then I have to put k as a logical variable here. OK. Similarly, I can frame this component, OK, add own to everything. So from not own to not own, I can change it to go from own to own. Does it make sense to people? What does this spec say? Can anybody tell me? If I've already taken the lock, why is it true that if I terminate, I still have the lock, but I have incremented by one? Yeah, so if I already own the lock and I call this procedure, this procedure will try to get the lock again. Therefore, it will loop forever because the lock is already taken. So it never terminates. It's an infinite loop. So what I write here doesn't matter. Okay, so if I own the lock, I will not actually be incrementing alpha s at all. I will be looping forever, but that doesn't matter. Okay? Yes? How did you go from 0, zero to 1 to uh, k to k the whole time? By, by framing. So there will be a frame rule, and I will show it to you, yes. It's, uh, the question is, what is the frame? Well, okay, I will tell you right away what the frame will be. So if I go from here to here, I will take the frame with respect to, I don't care, to frame heaps, so the heap component will be empty. I want to add k to the, other compo to the alpha component, and I don't care about how much I frame the, mu uh, the, uh, the mutex component. So here I say, not on. OK? So I will be framing this spec with respect to that, and you just put a k everywhere, or add k everywhere. <coughs> no, but we have a partial commutative monoid. So this jointness is now abstracted into something else, into the def definedness of the bullet operation. So. Remember I said partial commutative monoids have this predicate valid. Yeah, but you should be able to combine any integers. Oh, for integers, yes. Yeah. Well, that, what, I, what I was going to say is every integer is valid. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. Right. <coughs> okay. So this is, well, this is my, okay, my favorite thing to say here. So let me just say it out loud. Uh, what we have just managed to do is we have managed to come up with a principal specification, or principal type, if you will, for, the speci for, for inker 1. Okay? You can put this guy into parallel combination as many as you want. You don't even need to know how many threads you're going, going to have. You can, and one homework for you will be to uh, verify what happens if you iterate over a list, forking an inker for every element of the list. The proof should all be, should all be fine. But, <coughs> but we have found a type which abstracts away, which hides the implementation of Inker, stateful implementation of Inker, and hides its proof. Even the proof don't matter anymore, right? It used to in the case, in the classical setting, but it doesn't. So we have achieved an encapsulation of the code and proof together. And we can reason out, we, we can hide them just by putting the types. And the clients of Inker now just need to look at the type in order to verify <coughs> whatever they need to verify. They don't need to look at the code or the proof. So code and proof have become equivalent in this sense. And maybe somebody has mentioned to you during the lecture, during the previous lectures that, well, there is this idea of curry howard isomorphism whereby code and proof are the same thing, right? So this is the sense in which they are the same thing because you can put them together, you can combine them, and you can, they're both subject to being substituted into larger contexts, right? So you get a little bit of, what you get is something similar to curry howard isomorphism, but for concurrency, okay? Does the, does it make, make sense? Everybody's looking weird at me. No? <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. 
We verified the parallel composition, but we didn't verify this guy. So let's do that now. <laughs> How much time do I have left, if any? Well, okay, then let's not verify incur. <laughs> Let me just give you the other inference rules because it might be instructive. Okay. Now, the inference rule for lock says we start from the empty heap. <coughs> uh, we have some contribution, which is the unit of our PCM. So this is a rule which is parametric in the, your choice of your PCM, right? And we don't own the lock. <coughs> what do you imagine is going to happen here <coughs> in the post condition? So it's not, no. But I mean, this, this, is, this part is right. So we are changing to own. But here, we are now taking the resource invariant. So our heap now becomes something which says, ah, I guess you couldn't have guessed it because I didn't give you the, in the information before. The invariant now becomes a predicate over a heap and a sum of, a, sum of alpha. Alphas, alpha s and alpha o. Okay, so in, for this particular example, it would be x points to, it would be, I'm sorry, sigma is equal x points to alpha. But when we get this invariant, it's interpreted like this. Sigma becomes part of our heap, of our, of our sigma s, and this alpha gets substituted with whatever is the sum of alpha s and alpha o. So this is how it goes, sigma s, for sigma, uh, okay, and okay, and alpha o for alpha in I. Does this make sense? Well, fine, okay, you, you, you know what I mean, okay? I, could, I should have probably written this as I sigma S alpha. <laughs> okay. Let's say that it's a predicate of a two variables, sigma and alpha, instead of putting lambdas explicitly, okay? And then, then we write it like this. Yeah, I'm sorry, I keep switching between these two things. It's just second nature to me, so I'm sorry if that's confusing. <clears throat> Okay, now, unlock gets to be very interesting now. Because now we don't just say unlock L, but it turns out you actually have to add a piece of a function here, phi, which says how you want to change your mutable state, your auxiliary state, okay? In particular, in our example here, I would say unlock, and then phi, phi would be a function which says, whatever you had in your, in your AS, add one to that. Okay, and then I pass the lock that I want to work with. <laughs> so we don't have explicit commands now which mutate stack variables, because we don't have stack variables, but when we want to, exact a mutation on this state, well, we just pass a function which, well, you pass the old state, it gives you the new, the old AS, AS it gives you the new AS. So now we have, with that in mind, this becomes, okay. Huh. If we have some A here, which is our old value, and we had the lock. So notice we cannot be unlocking if not if, if we didn't own the lock to start with. Then here we'll get sigma s is empty. Alpha s will become phi of a, and we don't have the lock anymore. And here we get 
sigma s for sigma, phi of a bullet alpha o for alpha in i. Ah, okay. So, in order to unlock, I first have to exhibit that my heap satisfies the invariant i, where it holds of my heap, so I'm going to give it all away. But the ghost, the auxiliary variables, by the way, they're also called ghost variables sometimes. So if you hear me saying auxiliary or ghost, it's the same thing. The ghost is such that I have already established that it holds for whatever AO alpha I had, but now it holds for the old value mutated or, or modified by phi. And then I'm just releasing the whole heap. It goes away, but this guy changes. So it used to be A, but now it's phi A. Let me give you, uh, there's much more here to be done, OK? <clears throat> By the way, this phi cannot be an arbitrary function. So that's important also. OK. It has to be so-called local function. So when you work with partial commutative monoids, local functions keep appearing. Just like when you work with, I don't know, CPOs, you get continuous functions to appear all, all the time. What is the local function? OK. Well, that function says that basically it's, it's a function which doesn't care how much you frame it with. Formal definition. OK, formal definition. Let me just find it somewhere, make sure that I don't, I don't mess it up. <coughs> OK. If I have that valid, so phi is local. If for every A and B, so this is generic to a PCM, so any PCM, the same definition holds, and valid phi of A, then phi of A bullet B is phi of A bullet B, but now B is outside the brackets. Okay? Does this make sense? This says, literally, this says this function doesn't care what you frame it with. Okay, if I want to, to, to run it on some argument A framed with B, well, you could have just run it on A and then add the frame after the fact. So if you don't insist on the locality, then you lose the frame rule. So everything becomes unsound. So this is a very important property. Okay, so you can see obviously incrementation by one is a local function, right? I can just add one and, okay. If phi is plus one, then yeah, clearly it holds. <coughs> Um, but I mean, you can see that it's, it's, it's not going, going to be just about adding things, right? So in the PCM of heaps, let's consider the function d alloc, which is defined to take a heap, okay, d alloc x, to take a heap sigma and, and now say, say uh, let's define it like this. Um, if x is not in, sig in the heap sigma return undefined, Otherwise, make sig make, uh, remove x, right? So return sigma with x being sent to undef. Does this make sense as a definition? You can see that this is a local function by this, uh, by this very definition on the PCM of heaps. Because if I try to unlock over a dot b, <coughs> Well, if x is not anywhere, neither in A nor in B, then this is undefined. And therefore, it's equal to unlock A bullet B. I'm sorry, not unlock, D alloc. <laughs> Should use D alloc, D alloc x. And if x is in A, then it's not in B, because this thing is supposed to be defined OK, so if I, if I just want to remove x from the composition, it's the same as removing it from the left side and just attaching the right side. OK. And if it's on the right side, then removing it from the left side doesn't make sense. So I'm going to return undef. Um, oh, but I have this condition, which says that it's in the left side. 
Okay? <coughs> so, local functions are an important thing when you work with partial commuting monoids. Okay, that's, that's, that's important to know. And just one more thing then before I let you go. Let me give you one inference rule for a primitive command. Let's say monadic unit. Because it will also expose something interesting uh, on which we'll build in the next lecture. <coughs> so return x has a type which says, OK, sigma s is empty. <coughs> Alpha s is I don't care, so monadic unit or what, anything, right? And now I have to say here m. I cannot say not own. And I have a conjunct which says, if m is own, then alpha 0 is a. And I need this m to be uh, declared here. <coughs> oh, and also a. And in the post condition, I say sigma s is empty. Alpha s is, I just copy everything. Mu s is m. And m is own implies alpha o is a and r is x. Does anybody have an idea what this mysterious conjunct here is saying? And why do I need it? <coughs> it says, OK, I'm going to run, ret I'm, I can run this command return outside of a critical section when I don't own the lock, or inside the critical section when I do. OK? The incrementation example would exactly have that. It would be running, um, well, return or mutation and hookup inside a critical section. But if I'm the one who has grabbed the lock, nobody else can mess with the state, with the shared variable x. Therefore, I can change my alpha s, but nobody can change their alpha s's. Because for them to change their alpha s means they have to have the lock. But I have the lock, so they cannot change their stuff. So they cannot change my alpha o. Okay? Um, so whatever it was in the precondition of this command, so a, it remains the same in the post condition. Okay? So I propagate the information that, well, nobody can mess with the state once I own it, once, once, once I grab the lock. And that was, if you recall, I emphasize that in the proof of inker, I have to know that b is not changed by the other guy on the left side. This is what it says. b here we call it alpha O, is not changed if we own the lock. OK. So another way of people, people say this is that the value of alpha O is stable if we have the lock. So this is often referred to as stability property. And in this particular case, in this particular setting where we work with, with a lock, <coughs> we say that the predicate R is stable Okay. Um, if R implies, and let me just copy this. Um, if mu s is own, then alpha o else whatever, substitute that for alpha o in R. If you can prove this implication, we call R a stable predicate. What does this definition say? It says, R is stable if, if R holds now, then I let, let the other guys run for a while. They can change the alpha O if they want to, but only if it's not me who owns the lock. If the R predicate still holds, then we call it stable. So what does it mean to be stable? It means to be, it doesn't change on the interference of other threads. The other guys can mess as much with, with the state as they want, but you just didn't state things in the predicate R that they could change. Okay, that's, that's this definition. And we'll generalize it in the future for a, for a, for a fine-grained concurrency where, well, this would not be our definition to do something else, but it would essentially have the same spirit. It says you are invariant under the whatever the other guys can do to you. And then we have this inference rule, the frame rule, which says P, C, Q, P circle star R, C, Q circle star R, 
if r is stable. So I told you over there, OK, if you're not looking, um, that I'm framing with respect to a certain predicate r, which now I erased, but it used to say sigma s is empty, alpha s is k, mu s is known. The conjunction of these three things, can you guess why is this stable? Just look at the definition. If I call this r, then I'm changing r on the right-hand side here by, well, by removing or substituting something for alpha o. But there's no alpha o here at all, so <laughs> nothing changes, right? Another way to see why this is stable is it just talks about things that I own. They're all self-predicates, right? self-components. But what I own, other people cannot mess with. So whatever the other guys, the other threads in the composition do, well, they cannot change what I have. So this must be stable. OK? One more question. And this is more our homework than, I mean, I won't work it out. But <coughs> just to test your intuition now. We're going back to the locality. Let's imagine that we have a function like this on natural numbers, which says alpha s minus 1. Now let me put a dot here to make it clear that if alpha s is 0, then the whole thing is 0. Do you think, what do you think of this function? Is this local? Uh, let me repeat the definition of locality. Valid, and let me make it for natural numbers. So a plus b, and valid phi a, then phi of a plus b is phi of a plus b. <coughs> Any suggestions? Right, so this is not local. Right, because if you choose, you know, a is 0, um, and b 1, then here you get f of phi of 1, that becomes 0. And here you get, well, phi of 0, that's undefined, plus 1, the whole thing will be undefined. Um, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. If I of 0 is 0, yes. Plus 1, I get 1 here. So yeah, I'm sorry. Everything still remains valid. OK, what does this mean? It means that if in this soup of parallel increments that I want to do, I have one thread which says, no, you're decrementing. OK, the whole thing doesn't work. But you see that it shouldn't. Because if I had a composition like that, well, then the result ends up being dependent on the scheduler, right? If the guy who decrements gets scheduled when the whole sum is 0, then we lose its effect. OK. That doesn't mean that the system is wrong. It just means you choose a different partial commutative monoid in order to capture that. And your homework will be to figure out what that partial commutative monoid should be. OK? All right, that's it, I guess. We're done here. Thanks. <laughs>